It's 1028. I live over in Autumn Ridge. And our service is at 11 down in Spotsylvania. So my wife and our other kids, all but one, went down to church earlier. And my wife is the responsible adult in the house. And so I was like, man, should I wear the blue shirt or the gray shirt? And I checked your website. I was like, oh, their church starts at 1030. I was like, man, you get in the minivan. And so we're flying down the street. The van door's open. He dove in, but we made it. I, you don't believe me? I don't even have socks on this morning. I, but I, I'm super thankful to be here with y'all. And before I, I talk, and Ted, let me just make a disclaimer. If I get long-winded, please just come up here and gently usher me off stage. Because I want you to get in the word this morning. Um, I want to... First, thank you all as Pillar Stafford. I have been so encouraged by your work and God's grace in and through you in this community in just the short time you've been here as a church, I think since last August, if I'm right, specifically the Afghan ESL ministry. So you may not know, but it has had a profound impact on my family. I live in Autumn Ridge, just, well, three minutes on my last drive, usually about 10 minutes away. And we, um, we have Afghan neighbors who just moved in. They were one of the last folks to get out of Afghanistan. We see him walking by our house over the last couple months, and so we struck up a friendship, a relationship with them. Magul and Sona, if you're working and you've met them, Magul and Sona, and uh, Saeed Ahmad and Fahim and Siavash or others who haven't come yet. But in talking with them, we said, how can we help you? And they need to learn English. And so because of what Mike and Ted are doing, I said, well, I know a church that's offering free ESL. Would you like to go? Like, yes. And then you all come and you pick them up and you drove them there and you drive them back and I, uh, my wife, like Ted, is giving Sona the driving lessons, which is super exciting. And uh, she can't say enough good things about what we all are doing. And for the gospel, I know you're praying for them. We want to teach them English, but we want them to come to know Christ. And what better way to do it than just to love on them, teach them English from the Bible, and just see what God does. So thank you for your faithfulness in that. It's, be- it's, it's what the church is supposed to be and do, and I really appreciate it. So from Redeemer Stafford, let me just say thank you. Pastor Mike asked me to come this morning and share just a little bit of my story. I'm just going to give you a very condensed version um, in a way that hopefully will connect to your sermon this morning. And so you'll take the truth of God's scripture and hopefully through this connect it to your life right now. Your busy, hectic, crazy, messy life if it's anything like mine. So scripture and this hopefully connects to your, to your life story right now, not years from now. And... I want to be as clear as possible from the outset. Sometimes I share my story, and I just want to make sure you understand I am not the example in this. My wife is amazing, but my wife is not the example. Her name's Molly. Jesus Christ is the example in anything I'm about to tell you, and every good and perfect gift in my life is only from him and by his grace. So please, like, forget my name, but focus in on Christ as I tell this story. I'm going to speak on foster care and adoption, and I don't know most of you here. I know a few of you. And some of you have no experience with this at all. If you were like me a few years ago, I I had no background in foster care and adoption. Some of you have walked this road. You've fostered or you've adopted or you've been fostered or adopted as children. I, I don't know. But the concept of adoption should not be foreign to us as Christians. That concept of you and I were adopted by God through his grace, by faith in Jesus Christ. You were adopted by no merit of your own. He chose you to be part of his family as a son or a daughter. He adopted you into his family with all the rights and responsibilities and privileges therein. It's a beautiful, Ephesians chapter 1, uh, Pastor Ted's going to talk about some of that this morning. As you think about this beautiful picture of the gospel and adoption, he's called you and I as witnesses to extend that same type of love to the people in and around us in a very tangible way. It's not sort of way out there. It's, it's right here and now. And so I'm, this is proposition. I'm, I'm going to ask you to do something by talking to you this morning. They give you a little bit of knowledge, but I'm really calling you to do something as Christians, and we'll get to that in just a minute. To be super honest with you, I'm 40, I turned 44 last week. Until age 37, this was not even on my radar. I served in the Marine Corps like many of you, 10 active, 10 reserve. In, in my Marine Corps job, I was always thinking about the next qualification, the next promotion, the next deployment. It's like boom, boom, boom. And then what am I going to do when I get out of the Marine Corps? That was really on my mind. And then through a series of circumstances after 10 years of active duty, my wife was a Marine too. She was a much better Marine than I am. I became a high school teacher and that was too hard. <laughs> I lasted five years as a PE coach and a history teacher. And I ended up in federal law enforcement. And God brought me and my wife and our four biological kids to Little Rock, Arkansas. And I'm from San Diego. I didn't even know where Arkansas was on the map. And he plopped us down in Little Rock, Arkansas. And we are Christians, y'all. Arkansas, y'all. We are Christians. 
I love Jesus. My wife loved Jesus. He blessed us with four kids in five years. So when we got to Little Rock, we moved from my family, our church, our network, to a place where I knew nobody. We bought camouflage in a pickup truck and said, I appreciate you, and that's about how, how we fit in. Uh, uh, and about the same time, God was working in our heart, in our life, and we read this book called Radical by Pastor David Platt. He pastors a church up uh, in, in Washington, McLean Bible Church. And the real theme of this book was in nominal Christianity. Like, are you, are you a nominal Christian in name only? Like, do you read the Bible and with the love for Christ actually do what it says? Or you just assume that hard stuff's for other people? And it was really convicting. I would commend the book to you. But we read this book. And again, my wife did 10 years of active duty, three tours in Iraq, four kids under the age of seven, a new place. And she comes up to me shortly thereafter and she says, Justin, I, I think we need to consider foster care. I was like, huh? Like, you're crazy. Like, we, we barely can parent our own kids. We can't bring more kids into this house. And she's like, why, why wouldn't you even consider it? Like James 1.27 says, true, pure, faultless religion is this, to care for, to visit, to look after orphans and widows in their distress. We have the ability to do this. We need to consider it. I was like, Molly, let's get real. Like, I don't want to love a little kid, a boy or a girl, and have to give him or her back. That would break my heart. And she looked at me, and her call sign was Viper. She's very tough. She looked at me, and she said, it's not about you, is it? She walked off. I was like, Ugh. I was like, I still don't want to do it. <laughs> so a short time later, she came up to me um, after the kids were in bed. She said, here's the deal. There is a Christian organization, Children of Arkansas Love for a Lifetime, a nonprofit there in Little Rock that partnered with local churches, and they would help provide training and respite and encouragement and resourcing for church families who might be interested in foster care. She's like, will you just come with me to a free dinner? I'm not asking you to foster. Just come to a free dinner. I like food. I love my wife. I love dates. I was like, sure, I'll go to a dinner. I'll do that. So I went to this dinner, and a lady got up there, and she gave us a bunch of facts on foster care and adoption and the statistics and the need, and it was interesting, but I had an awesome piece of chicken and some rice and a Diet Coke, and I was really just focused on that, happy to be there with my wife. But then um, a younger teenager got up to speak, and she got up in front of a crowd about like this, and she started talking. She says, my name is, at a young age, as a little girl, I was abused by my daddy. And he was taken from my home, and my mommy went to prison. And so I went to a group home, and I went to another group home. And a uh, foster family, and another foster family. But then this older, single lady fostered me. But she didn't just foster me, she loved me. She loved me, and she told me I was beautifully and wonderfully and fearfully made by God, and that I'm not a mistake that I matter, and that God loves me, and Christ died and rose from the dead for my sins, and I became a Christian. I gave my life to Jesus, and she is adopting me, and I, I, she adopted me, and I'm her daughter now, and I'm going to college because of her, and I'm crying all over my chicken. I'm like, this is so heavy, and I turn around to my wife, and she's filling out the forms. I'm like, guns up, Molly. Let's do this. We're going to be a foster family, so that's how we ended up where we're at. Like, that was the beginning. It wasn't because I'm super spiritual, but she got my heart, Right? It's a real person, and God radically changed her life through one faithful Christian's obedience, a single older woman. She had all kinds of reasons not to do that, and that girl's life was radically transformed. So my wife and I, we went to the training, and i got to be honest, I thought I knew how to parent. I don't know how to parent. They told me to put the knives away. I'm like, you have to put the knives away in the house? And so they come, and they do a home uh, inspection and an FBI background check. At the time, I was an FBI agent. I'm like, really? You're going to make me do a background check? <laughs> And so it was, it was inconvenient. I had to do some training. They came into my house, looked at my finances. We got certified, and then nothing. We just continued to do life. And then we got a call one day. We're at the lake. The kids are playing. I get a call. Hey, we got a baby. We take the baby. Two-day-old baby, positive for opioids. We put on the forms, no babies. We just got out of diapers at home. We just want, like, medium-sized children. <laughs> I don't know if you're supposed to say that. And so I can remember it vividly, a pickup truck. It's Arkansas. I'm like, Molly, Molly, you want a baby? She's like, what are you talking about? It's foster care. Do we want a baby? She's like, well, sure, let's have a baby. Come, bring the baby. So two hours later, they show up with this little beautiful black baby girl named Janiah, adorable, in a box of diapers. And they said, we'll be in touch. And they left. My kids were ecstatic. They thought, this is where babies came from. They just show up, and here you go. <laughs> no joke. Our life was radically transformed at that moment. I don't have time to talk all the details, but 
super hard. She's positive for opioids. She didn't sleep. My wife was run ragged within about a week. I still had to go to work, so Molly did the lion's share of the work. We have four kids under seven, and now baby Janaya. We had a Christian couple who got certified for foster care, but they were, they were a little older. They couldn't commit to taking in a baby, but they committed to helping other families who did. So they reached out to us, and they said, hey, we'd love to take her for a night. That was just enough. My wife's like, oh, we can go another week. We had a family from the church who had lost a little baby girl at birth. They had four boys. They really wanted to adopt a little girl. They went through the foster training with us. They said, hey, we'll take her for a night. Every week we'll take her. They got us another week, another month. And then my job moved me here to Virginia in 2017. But Janiah was still in foster care. There was no option to adopt. So that family who was providing respite, the younger family, hey, we'll take her in and foster her. They ended up adopting her and her sister. Her life is forever changed. So we got here to Virginia in 2017, and we're like, we're foster family. That's what we do for Jesus. We're going to foster. We went to DSS, and they said, we don't need you. Department of Social Services just down the road. We're like, what do you mean you don't need us? That's what we do as Christians. I, I don't know what else to do in this affluent area where everybody has a ton of money and doesn't want to do things that matter. I'm being overgeneralizing. But that's my impression. That was my impression. What do you mean we can't foster? How am I going to live fully for Jesus if I don't do something here? It was really hard for me. And about two weeks later, we got a Facebook blast from a friend of ours who had adopted from Liberia. They said, there's these two little boys. Their parents were murdered. They were found wandering in the jungles. They're four twins. They need a home. Will somebody adopt them? We're like, thank you. So we started the process. Paid $500, started the international adoption process. It's about $48,000 plus or minus to adopt twins from Liberia at the time. I was a GS-12. My wife stayed home. We didn't have that kind of money. We do. Just my wife's like, we're just going to trust God. Inside, I was like, all right, we'll cash in the retirement accounts, and I will enroll in seminary because the GI Bill will pay me some money to study the Bible. That's a pretty good deal. And so that's what I did. I enrolled in seminary so I can make some money to pay for the adoption. I have a full-time job. Um, but then about a month later, we got a call from Social Services, and they said, you know what we said we didn't need you? We were lying. Uh, we kind of need you right now. We have a baby boy and his brother who were abused. The boy's a week old. His brother's a year and a half. Will you take him for just a couple weeks? I'm like, okay, Liberian boys, it's going to take a couple years. Yeah, absolutely. We'd love to. So Jade and Krista were moving in with us here in Stafford. And fast forward, um, about two years later, we adopted Jade and Christopher. And then we went and brought home Leo and Owen from Liberia. And our family of four or six became a family of ten. And about, um, about a year later, the half-sister of Jane and Christopher came into care, and we'll be adopting her next, in the next month or so. And so why do I tell you that? That's not to tell you that, oh, we're so great. We're not great. Jesus is great. But I tell you that because little acts and steps of obedience, whether it's Molly or this older couple or this family or countless examples that I'm going to talk about in a second from folks here in Stafford of saying yes to what's clear. You don't have to wonder I've spent a lot of time in my life, in the Marine Corps especially, wondering, okay, God, what's your will for my life? Like, I know you got me here now, but really, what do you want me to do with my life? And what I've learned, and what I'm learning, is that he's got something for you right now where you're at. But you're going to have to surrender control. And my wife and others said, look, God, it's all yours anyways. Like this facade that I actually control my life, I don't, you do. And as it pertains to orphan care, James 1.27 takes out all the ambiguity you don't have to wonder, am I supposed to do something for orphans? Yes. Yes. If you're a Christian, you're a witness of the gospel. You're supposed to do something, not out of guilt or obligation. Oh, Justin told me to. I feel guilty. I better do something. No, 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 no. The deep love in your heart for Jesus Christ and what he's done for you compels you to do something. What that is, I don't know. Every story is different. I will tell you in this little church, because of seminary, one of my assignments, I had to make a ministry plan. I was a helicopter pilot. I don't know nothing. I don't know nothing. I don't know anything about ministry plans. <laughs> it's pretty bad. I was like, well, what am I going to write a ministry plan about? So I just said, well, I'll do the one about orphan care. I sort of know about that. So I put together a ministry plan, and the pastor at a little church plan. I was like, why don't you just present it to the congregation? I never preached before I got up. So I gave a sermon on orphan care. I lost my voice the, the night before because I was so nervous. So it wasn't the, the best sermon ever, but it started an orphan care ministry at Redeemer Spotsy. In two years... They've funded, completely funded two international domestic adoptions. We've seen over a dozen kids come into foster care, a couple adopted, and lives 
radically transformed. Not just the children, families, entire families. I have one here I'm going to talk about in a second. Lives flipped upside down for the gospel in a tangible, real way that is unmistakable. Like God's hand at work in ways you can't control because you're surrendering in control to God in these moments. Saying, I'm going to invite a little child or a teenager with trauma into my home and trust God that he's going to provide. And I've seen, we've seen him move in ways I've never seen before. And it's super encouraging. And so one of the reasons I came here this morning is to encourage you. With, and I know you'll have a lot going on. I know it. For the Marines, I've been there at least a while back. I'm getting older now. And, and for the, the spouses of Marines, my wife was a Marine, but then she, I think we did eight deployments in eight years. Life is hard with little kids. There's all sorts of burdens in your life. But I'm going to encourage you this morning to consider orphan care. I'm going to encourage you to start by going home, and if you have a family, get on your knees with your kids at some point today and just pray about it. God, what would you have us do? Like, clear your mind for a moment, because life doesn't get less busy. That's my experience anyways. There's always something that's going to be pressing at you. But today, when you get home, get on your knees. God, I love you. My life is yours. Whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will save it, will find it. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world? It loses or forfeits his soul. Get on your knees. God, it's yours. What would you have us do here with orphan care? There's lots of options. Let me just encourage you to start with prayer and involve your kids because it's a family decision. It's not a one person. Your spouse has to be on board. As a church, pray about it. God's called this church in the same way you're doing with ESL to be a, a light for the gospel for orphans. And there are needs. There are real needs here in Stafford. It's not something that happens out there in those other parts of this world. Last week, a week and a half ago, we got a call our orphan care directors, Zach and Jacqueline, got a call from this senior caseworker at Stafford DSS. An 11-year-old girl came into care. She's pregnant. And the situation is awful. Here's the beauty. Like, that's tragic. But that's the beauty of the gospel, because the gospel is about redemption. And who else would I want Stafford County services to call but the church? Children were never meant to be raised by the government. They were meant to be raised by God's people. And, and that is a stewardship that you enter into as a Christian. And so this family, Jacqueline and Zach, love Jesus. They have three kids of their own. They have a foster baby they got about eight months ago from the NICU. They love this little boy. And they say yes. They sent out an email to the group. There's about 13 of us in the, our little church. We're not even a church yet. We're, we're a church plant. Hopefully we'll see in August maybe. But. And we had multiple families said, we're in, whatever it takes, whatever you need, we're going to do this. So that little 11-year-old, that's my daughter. One of my daughters is 11. The C-section's May 30th, and tw twice a week she'll go over and be with that family. Uh, Monday she's going to hang out with my daughters. And so that brings up another point. I'll wrap up, Ted. The biggest question I get when it comes to foster care and adoption from young families, and there's a lot of young families, I think, is what about my biological kids? Like, how will this affect my biological kids? It depends. What is your goal for your biological kids? What is your goal? Because this culture says your goal for your kids is to keep them really safe, have them do super well in school, get a scholarship, be successful, get a job, have a family, enjoy life, be comfortable. The gospel says something radically different. My goal for my children, and I... I I say this like I have it figured out. This is a struggle for Molly and I because I love my kids. But my goal is that they would fall so in love with Jesus Christ. They would do and be whatever he's called them to do and to be. And what better way to show your kids that you love Christ than open up your home to a child in need for the sake of the gospel? Like it's one thing that Sunday school, essential. Church gathering is essential. Singing, giving, praying, we do that. That's the function of a church. But you want to grab their heart. Have them participate with you in foster care or adoption. And see what God does, because you're trusting God here. And I can't guarantee it's going to go real well. I can give you examples where it hasn't gone well. We had a family in our church taking a girl who was a lot of trauma, trafficked by her own parents. It only lasted a week and a half, two weeks, and she had to go be put in an institution. But for that two weeks, they walked through that mess with their whole family. Another little boy from Afghanistan, Khalid, about my son's age, about 10, as a baby in Afghanistan, a suicide bomber blew up. Killed his mom. She was holding him at the time. They found him in the rubble, but he was alive. His dad eventually made his way here with his uncle and then neglected him and abandoned him too. He came into foster care in Stafford County. Family in the church said, hey, please send him to our house. 
He came to church the first week. He was up in front. We had a kids' choir that weekend. He was up singing Jesus songs. It was amazing. Huge scar on his chest. He barely survives. Like, it's super messy, but it's worth it. You don't have to wonder if it's worth it. I can guarantee, I can make one guarantee 10 billion years from now, you'll have no regrets that you stepped into orphan care for the sake of the gospel. I can't guarantee it's easy. In fact, it will be difficult. It will be hard. We've cried a lot at my house. I, I am the crier. Viper is not the crier, but we both cried a little bit. <laughs> it's a struggle. And some days I'm like, God, I don't know. And I've seen it in other families' lives. Who... So let me just encourage you, as Pastor Ted talks from Scripture this morning about what the family is, and I think it's Galatians 6 that you're covering, and what God's design is for the family. So often, and for 37 years, I thought, yeah, the family, my wife and my kids. And it's so much more than that. Just like this family is so much more than just Jews or Gentiles. Like God's family is for everybody. Your family is more than maybe you think it might be or should be. Last thing I'll say is some of you are like, I just don't have the capacity, Justin. My heart is tugged, but I couldn't do it. I mean, I'm single. I don't have resources. Or I'm older. Whatever the situation is. I think of an example of a couple in our church. They didn't have the ability to have the children in their home for specific reasons. But he came up to me one day after church and he said, Justin, how much money do you need for this adoption we're walking through for another family? I said, we're about 10,000 short right now. He just wrote me a check and handed me a check for 10,000. He said, you need anything else, you just let me know. He's like, and don't let anybody know who gave you the money. I want it to be anonymous. So there is a place for you in orphan care, but it starts with you going before God and saying, what do you have for me, Lord? Because if I use my own logic, I can't do it. There's a family here today, Brandon and Brooke. Will you just raise your hand right there? Brandon and Brooke are best friends of ours. Brandon, Brandon was an Army Ranger. Don't hold it against him that he was in the Army. Uh, he works with me now, and he's an elder at our church plant. They've adopted from Ethiopia years ago. And since we've been here together, we've known them for a few years, they've walked through foster care. And a few of those stories was that family. Um, they have four children, one adopted. They have two foster kids right now. And they would love to talk to you after service. They're some of the nicest people I've ever met. So if for no other reason, just go say hi. But if you have very specific questions, I, I would refer you to them. I have to run right now for another meeting. And down the road, if you have more questions, we would love to partner with you. So if some of you all want to walk through foster care and adoption, that's what churches do. We come alongside one another for the sake of the gospel. So let me do this. I think I've exceeded my time. Ted, would you like to come up here real quick? Thank you. Thanks for giving me. They told me 10 minutes. I think I went 16. I'm sorry. All right, we need to pray for our brother and sister, for uh, the Wooder family, and for all our brothers and sisters that are involved in this partnering with the, the new church and what's going on here in Stafford. Let's just pray. All right. Heavenly Father, we are very grateful um, as we're going to be just continuing to think through this whole idea of why you came to earth in your son and what this adoption has done in our hearts and how we can have a real love for people who are not our family. God, I pray that you would bless Molly and Justin. I pray that you would help their family and all the families, Father, uh, that he's mentioned here. God, you know them, and you know all the nameless ones right now that are out here in Stafford County and that are all over the world, and you know divine appointments that you want to make. And we ask that you would do that, Father, through us. Help us to be a yielded people and bless these brothers and sisters who are on target, on task, ministering this way. God, may you continue to make their testimony infectious because Jesus is, is glorified. Jesus is lifted up. We pray in his name now. Amen. Amen. Thanks Thank you, brother. You. All right. We want to just continue what our brother was talking about. And one thing, um, there's going to be a little resource sheet at the back. Uh, it's already there. Um, would love for you to take this home. It's got some books, some articles. Uh, it's got some great reference places to go uh, so that you can't just go home and kind of forget. Uh, these are important things that our brother has opened up to us. So please grab that as you go out uh, in the back today. A uh, number of passages that Justin has mentioned, and I'm going to touch on a couple of them, and then we're going to close with Psalm 68 four through six. So we're not going to turn there right now, but we're going to conclude with Psalm 68. In Christ, none are alone, as our brother has just shown us. And that includes our families that need to be affected by this, need to be moved by this truth. Um, God is not looking for sympathy on our parts. He's not even looking for empathy. Those are good things. 
but he's looking for us to say, God, how should I be faithful in this call? How do you want me to be faithful? How, what part do you want me to play? I know I'm a player in it. You adopted me as your child, and you set me in this adoptive family of Christ. So God, help me to step toward that. Well, to begin with, I want us to um, just think about uh, this idea of a vertical relationship where God, God came down and created this relationship of a vertical mankind to God, and then God caused that vertical relationship to work horizontally, mankind to mankind. And so we're going to just look at it that way and this way. And uh, it's stuff that Justin's already talked about. The first one is adoption by God, and we're going to look at uh, Galatians 4. Galatians 4, verses 4 through 7. I'll read for us. Our hearts have been tugged by these stories that our brother has given us. I'm sure if you're like me, your mind has kind of been thinking of pictures of what's it like to be in the home and having craziness going on and racing to soccer games and racing to doctor appointments and going down to DSS and sitting there and waiting forever for appointments and just all the craziness of this kind of life. And yet God knows and God cares and God wants us to trust him as we step toward this stuff. So Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. When the time came to completion, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, you're a son. And if you're a son, then God has made you his heir. There's so much in this passage. It's just beautiful. It's sweet. It's, it's touching on so much that our brother already opened up to us. Think about this, this first idea here. To think about human concepts of adoption, we really have to first look at what the Scripture says adoption is. God defines adoption, not in human terms, but in divine terms. The brokenness of mankind. He made us for his glory. He made us perfect. We're the ones that chose to turn our back on him. And we severed a relationship with him. And so God is in the business of bringing back that broken relationship. And he uses adoption to do that. That's the tool. That's the vehicle. And so that pattern of adoption then becomes this mega narrative. It's the big picture behind everything else. That God is in the business of drawing the people back through the redeeming work of his son, Jesus Christ. So God uses means. He uses the son of his love, Jesus, to come to earth in order to make this beautiful picture of adoption happen. The payment price has to happen somehow, and it's through the adopting work, uh, through the redeeming work of his son. Similar passage, Ephesians 2, 13, God has adopted sinners for himself. Now you, who were once far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So that's God's vertical power going on, working into our fallenness. Here in, um, in this passage, verse 4, it tells us that he had a plan all along, that God was not thrown off course by our rebellion, by the sin of Adam and Eve, and by the sin of all mankind. We're just a part of a whole train of brokenness, of sin, of severed relationships amongst ourselves, of broken families, of parents not doing their job, not caring of you and I sinning and messing up and having some good times too, okay? We're a part of this whole course of rebellion, and it says in verse 4, in the fullness of time. That's denoting God's sovereign work. God's got something that he's doing that's bigger than our brokenness. So he's not standing back going, "Uh uh-oh, what do I do now? Look what mankind has done to me. No, instead, God's fully confident in what he's going to do. So God comes near. What's this plan all about? The gospel writer John tells us this in John 1.14, the word Jesus became flesh and he dwelt among us. God came near. So God's plan is adoption is going to be me coming very near to a broken people that don't want me. I don't know about you, but you know, when my child is kind of rebelling, I don't want to be around them. 
I tell him, oh, sweetheart, it's okay, you'll get over that, daddy loves you. But in my heart, I'm going, look, I brought you into this world. I'm sacrificing for you. Like, what right do you have? You know, this is the narrative going on in my mind. What right do you have to, you know, do this? But I'm trying to act like the nice dad and this godly man and talk nice talk. That's not my heart. You think about what God, the Father, whose pure holiness is thinking when he says, I'm going to send my most beloved, cherished son to this earth. And he is going to die. He's going to suffer the pangs of murder of hatred. He's even going to go to the depths of judgment. Hell, he's going, to, he's going to preach to spirits that are imprisoned by Satan's lies, all for your brokenness. I don't get it, but I'm sure thankful he did it. Amen. So going on to identify with us, God's plan was that Jesus would have no father. Did you see what it says in verse 4? He's adopted by Joseph. It's Mary's husband that takes on Jesus, isn't it? So he's the son of Mary, but not of Joseph. He's born of a woman, not from a man. Jesus, in every way, was tempted, understood our pressures, knows what people have gone through, yet was without sin. That's our Jesus. This is God's plan of adoption. Going on, we... We now are friends of God, verse 5. The final step in this plan was this befriending strangers, taking rebels and strangers and drawing them in. Again, it makes no sense. Yeah, there are a few nice people out there that really go the extra mile and care about people. But this is God going against fallen humanity and making them his prized possession. It, 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 again, just kind of defies my understanding of, of what love is. So for verse, verse 5, he goes to take his son to pay the death sentence, Christ to become our substitute. And so now, verse 5, we are friends of God. The final step in his plan is that he adopts. These strangers become totally loved and granted all the rights and privileges of being an heir. And this is what's so sweet about adoption. It makes no sense. I remember when Janine and I, years ago, were in a foster adopt program with a little two-year-old that we had in our home, and we were so excited. We weren't going to be able to have children, but God was going to bring us this little girl. And I remember at our church, a man saying to me, he says, are you guys real about this? You really are going to go through with this? And I said, well, yeah. And he said, I don't get it. How could you bring somebody into your home who's not your flesh and blood and put your name on it? I just kind of feel like I'd be doing harm to my heritage, to my family. Like, you know, and I kind of looked at him. I thought, okay, like whatever. I think we're starting from two different vantage points here, dude. I think we are just totally seeing things different. And it is. It's, it's the gospel, and this man had the gospel, but he wasn't believing it. He wasn't thinking from the gospel, from this idea of adoption. And my friends, I hate to say it, but I think there's more of that kind of thinking than you and I want to admit. And maybe even some of that kind of thinking is quietly in us. Now, we might call it just prejudice. We might just call it stupid thinking. But it is part of what we have to confront in our own lives. All these little reasons and excuses why we don't step toward Jesus and trust him for things in our life. This kind of narrative stuff goes on in our minds, I think, more than we want to admit. Yes, I have sympathy for these poor children. Oh, Justin and Molly, look at, the, look at how wonderful they've done. And I have sympathy for these children and right down here at Courthouse Road at DSS here in County of Stafford. God doesn't want sympathy. God wants commitment. He wants us to put our hand to the plow and say, this is part of the cost of discipleship, of being loved with an everlasting love and being drawn into an eternal salvation wherein we're only here for just a little period of time because we're already seated with him in the heavenly places. So how hard is it for us to not just have sympathy or empathy, but to step toward it and trust God? This is all areas of our life, brothers and sisters, but boy, this is sure poignant here with foster and adopt situations, isn't it? Oh, I've got my reasons. You know, I'm 65 years old. We've raised our children. Uh, we live in a community that doesn't allow children um, over uh, under 18 years of old age. Oh, we're off the hook. No, we're not. 
We've got all kinds of responsibilities that God still lays out in front of Janine and me. They might not be living in our home because we can't right now, but we can sure stretch ourselves in all kinds of other ways. And what I'm getting at is you and I have to be saying, Jesus, you're my answer. Holy Spirit, you're my answer. You're going to help me figure out my part in all of this. Okay, uh, finally, this adoption is intimate. It's intimate, but it's awesome. Each of us are called a full child of his, verse 6. Why? He's saying we can cry out, Abba, Daddy, Father. (laughs) God, the God of the universe, the creator of heaven and earth, the one we've rebelled against. (laughs) And he says, you can call me Abba, Daddy. I'm yours. You see, that's what adoption's all about. It's so unique. It's just so counter me and you. It's just not how we operate, but it's how God operates. It's so beautiful. We go from a slavery to this world and the ways of thinking selfishly about ourselves, and we go from a slavery of trying to be good enough for God, but praise God that's all over because he says, no, you're going to call me Abba, Daddy. I'm your father. And I love you with an everlasting love. And there's nothing that's going to get in the way of my commitment to you that started before the foundation of the world in that wonderful economy of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit predestinating you in love, Ephesians 1. You just can't get around it. It's God. My brothers and sisters, if he's called us into this sonship, then we've got to embrace all the aspects of this sonship. And part of that is adoption. Part of that is helping the orphan. Part of that is helping the lonely. And let's just jump to uh, verse, uh, Psalm 68, 5 and 6. And we're going to close here. Psalm 68, 5 and 6. Adoption presses us to that horizontal mission. Okay? We have this vertical relationship with the Father that sets our hearts uh, ablaze with Him. And now, because of that, we can look at fellow human beings, fellow image bearers that are very unlike us. And for all the reasons that have happened in their lives, for the broken families, the messed up backgrounds, the horrible things that parents have perpetrated against their children, and we might want to say, not my mess, (laughs) they're screwed up, that's their problem. And I feel sorry for them, but... (laughs) What can I do? Ooh, again. If, if this adopting love has taken over my heart, then I'm saying, oh, Jesus, I can't just step back and say that's their mess. It's my mess. I'm part of this fallen humanity. I am called to love my neighbor who is not easy to love. I am called to move toward people who have screwed all kinds of things up, wasted my tax waiting list, while all these other yahoos don't get, get what they shouldn't deserve. You see, all that thinking is wicked, isn't it? All that thinking is about me trying to make sense out of life rather than saying, shut up. The Father in heaven says, I'm making many people cry out, Abba, Daddy, Father. And it's all at my expense of my son's blood. So quit trying to reconcile it in your mind. Quit trying to point fingers and have blame and, and, and push the fingers at society, push the fingers at government, as, at liberals, at tax and spend liberals, or whatever the stuff is that we want to use. Let's get real. God is calling us to just say, I need to be useful for God. I'm one player in his kingdom, and I have no excuses. I have a promise of a spirit who's going to use me. Psalm 68, verses 5 and 6. Let me turn there to read us this. The psalmist, David, has this awesome picture of God, and this is the one who is over his creation, wherein things here in Stafford County, though they seem like the rest of the United States, people are on drugs, people are messed up, people are all into their own little private lives, okay, this God is greater than all that. He says, sing to this God, Jehovah, who sing, sing praises to his name, exult in his glory, this one who rides on the clouds, For his name is Jehovah. That's a name that can't can't be excelled by anything else. He is the great I am. He is the Lord. Now celebrate in his presence. Because this God is holy. He is a father of the fatherless. He is a champion for widows. Our God provides homes for those who are the lonely. 
You see, this is the character of our God. This is the one who has come after you and me. This is the one who says, are you ready? Let me use you. Make yourself ready. It might be writing the check. (laughs) It might be being on a team of helpers who are going to give respite care. It might be just a person praying, putting that on your regular prayer list and pleading with God and asking God to expand your praying ability for foster families, for the broken and the lonely in our communities. Whatever it is, am I willing to say, God, make me part of your team. Help me. Oh, God, you are the one who provides a home for those who are the lonely. May I be part of that home for those who are broken, those who are oppressed, those who need what I have, my adoption in Jesus Christ. A quote from Scotty Smith that I I thought was really helpful. He said, adoption is not just filling the last chair at the table of your American dream family, but rather it is being part of his story in the world to remove ultimately the word orphan from our human vocabulary. Let's remember, his story is the kingdom. He's calling many in. Be a part of that. So I urge you, brothers and sisters, we have been forgiven much. We have been adopted and loved with a love that that we can't even understand. And I ask every one of you sitting here today, do you know the adoption of God? Are you adopted? Have you been loved with this everlasting love? Has your sin been forgiven? Has the weight and guilt of your brokenness been transformed through the blood of Jesus Christ? The only way you'll know that truly is by stepping toward him, confessing your sin, confessing that you are a sinner and in need of a savior. And today, God offers you that forgiveness. He says, Though your sins are red, they can be washed white as snow. Though you are an enemy, I will call you brother, sister, friend. My friend, if you're not a friend of God, if you have not been adopted by Jesus, then today is the day to step toward him and let him love you with that everlasting love. So I ask you today, this bigger picture of adoption must start right here in your own heart. Am I adopted by God? And based on that adoption of Jesus, you being a part of God's family, then you can step toward the others and you can truly give. May God help us to be a church that's growing in that way. I urge you, take this uh, resource here, uh, add this to your prayer list as a family, get to know adoptive families. We can certainly connect up with our brothers and sisters, uh, with Redeemer uh, Stafford that's going to be being planted soon, and uh, partner and help out. You might just say one more thing on the list. Who, the creator of the heaven and earth, has that list covered already? My God. It's, a, it's not a big enough list for him, okay? Let's trust him. Join with me. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time that we've had together. Thank you for the work that you're doing through all of these families that we've been uh, introduced to today and what you're doing worldwide. God, would you help us to be people who Um, don't just walk away um, and put this uh, on the table and cover it up with other things. God, we pray that you would help us to uh, be a people who are moved as adopted children toward those who need it. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.